Hello, everybody, and welcome to The DeSetto Files, a.k.a. The Ash Files, hosted by me, Ash Millman, joined by my horror experts over here, Elizabeth Bishop and Josh Brown. How are you doing, guys? Hello. Doing well. How are you doing, Ash? I'm I'm doing good. I'm feeling scared and afraid for this next bit, though, because we're going to be talking all about cosmic horror and Lovecraft as it relates to Alone in the Dark, which I'm really excited for. I know you guys are, too. There is so much cosmic nastiness going on in this game, in this series, and loads to dive into. So to give you a little taste of what we're going to be talking about in this episode, we're going to be taking a closer look at Alone in the Dark 2024, looking at cosmic horror and Lovecraftian storytelling, and then we're going to have a little quiz at the end. Yes. A lovely nice Yay. quiz. I'm really excited for this quiz now because yeah. I managed to pull away in the previous episodes yep. by some subterfuge and betrayal, admittedly, yeah. but now I'm excited to <laughs> try and win. Liz is just accepting this. Like, oh. Yeah, I think I'm just accepting my loss already on this one, but I'll give it a go. Yeah, I want to I want to see some tough competition here. Come on, fight each other. I'll fight to the death. There we go. Thank you. That was a good turnaround there, Josh. You're going down. I absolutely I am. I didn't expect it. <laughs> I don't I mean in the quiz, I just mean in general. <laughs> <laughs> you can't win a quiz if you're not here to take it. There we Correct. go. Uh, so this is episode two of our three-part series. And the first episode is all about the legacy of Alone in the Dark, our thoughts and feelings about the game, how it relates to survival horror in general. And now we're going to look at cosmic horror. So they go together very nicely. Nicely. The last episode is on Southern Gothic. Watch them all together or as separate little things if you like. But that's there if you want a little reference as to why we're talking about the previous quiz. But now let's dive into it. Cosmic horror then is a lovely, lovely turn of phrase. You know, this is totally a tangent, but my cousin had a cat called Cosmic Creeper. I just think it's the best name for a cat ever. That's pretty good. Yeah. I'm going to steal it if I yeah. ever get a cat, exactly. unfortunately. It's a black cat called Cosmic Creeper. And uh, so it cute. always thought felt very like Lovecrafty and the Cosmic mm. Creeper felt like something going through, you know, the, the, the planets, the stars in the space between space. <laughs> and I feel like apart from Cosmic Creeper, we should probably define what Cosmic Horror is mm-hmm. to understand that. So if I say cosmic horror to you guys, how would you come back to me and say, oh, yeah, it's this? How would you define it is probably the way I should ask that. I think the convoluted way (laughs) you asked that question, Ash, is indicative of how hard Mm -hmm. cosmic horror is in a way to kind of define. I think of the stars. I think of the unknowable. I think of gods and monsters kind of infringing on humanity. But I think a part of the appeal is the fact that a lot of cosmic horror is based around humanity's inability to perceive it in general yeah for sure how about you yeah i think the same i think um i would think of things that are just like incomprehensible Mm. like there's just no sort of rhyme or reason for things um i definitely think tentacly creatures um anything that's sort of on the edge of sci-fi but a bit more with like the natural world as well so like you say like rooted in sort of like space and nature and things like that but also just completely yeah uncomprehensible Mm. like what what is going on sort of vibes like maths yeah Yeah. Mm. i feel like you're setting this up for a dictionary definition of what cosmic horror actually is next (laughs) well i watched the explainer on the thq channel on Lovecraftian horror, which is available for anyone to watch as well. Cool. Um, but basically, there's an intercha- interchangeable nature with Lovecraftian horror because Lovecraft was such a mainstay of the genre and kind of built a lot of what it is uh, in his work. But I would say there isn't really a set definition. Mm-hmm. It's more of a feeling and it's the terror in the vastness and the unknowableness of the universe and kind of the terrible secrets from beyond that as well, that there is this solid sense of knowledge that is unattainable that is going to send you insane if you look at it that is the incomprehensible that is a a sanity bender like that's the kind of thing i would associate with cosmic horror things so big that your mind can't wrap around them Mm -hmm. you know and i think we've all kind of dabbled in a little bit of that with our descriptions there as well um so knowing what cosmic horror is how do you think that applies to Alone in the Dark 2024? Which is a massive question because I feel like it's ingrained in the very blood of this game. Every bit of rot feels like a little strand <laughs> of tentacle from Cthulhu himself. But I feel like it's it's worth it's worth just opening up to the floor. It's such a big question. I'm going to get let Liz 
Take it first. Oh, oh. you're going to let me. I'm going to put you on the spot and uh, <laughs> save, my, <laughs> save my own back in a cowardly fashion yet again. Yeah, um, I think it, it does it in so, so many ways. I think this could probably be a three hour episode just mm-hmm. discussing all of the different ways that it references different sort of facets of of cosmic horror you know everything from like the tentacly creatures um to the like the sort of the time jumps and the space jumps you know sort of one minute you're on a ship the next minute you're in the swamp the next minute you're climbing through mountains in the arctic and things like that um i think it references or rather, I guess, cosmic horror films that have come after it seem to have referenced like a lot of things within Alone in the Dark. Um, films like The Thing, The Void, The Mist, where it's all that sort of... There's creatures, but you don't really know where they've come from or why, or there's a certain mist or rot or, mm. you know, just that unexplainable feeling of dread that you get all the way through it where you don't really know what's going on or why and every single clue sort of leads you up a different avenue every character gives you a sort of different explanation and then it slowly but surely all sort of starts to to come together towards the end yeah there were so many times where i was playing through the game and i was just reminded of specific lovecraft stories like you mentioned going into the um sort of snow filled areas and you've got these old-timey explorers uncovering something and i think that immediately made me think of something like at the mountains of badness and mm-hmm. then you've got um you know haunted paintings which feels straight out of a uh, lovecraftian story but then in terms of like the proper cosmic element i think that comes into play the further you get into jeremy's dreams and remembrances mm-hmm. and these strange spaces one of my favorite areas in the game is when you go to the tomb the sarcophagus mm-hmm. and you're under the eclipse the black sun mm-hmm. and it's just so otherworldly and so yeah. strange in that kind of image of that eclipse sun for me at least kind of embodies what cosmic horror is kind of all about it's the idea that the reality that you perceive isn't can't be trusted mm-hmm. isn't actually definitive and there's something else more monstrous and less benevolent to lurk and beneath the the surface yeah like the eclipse being the the dark man's domain because it's in darkness and you can mm. come out something so vast that it wipes out the very sun from the sky from in between our planet and and you know the the void of space oh it's very dramatic <laughs> <laughs> uh i think for me i felt like the library in tarawaya was a really poignant cosmic horror reference because it literally is like a fortress of forbidden knowledge mm-hmm. it is this it is this place conjured up in jeremy's mind where he's put away everything he knows and then put it into books that people can't read or access or get to and it, it is the, the symbolism of forbidden knowledge in itself and then the dark man is roaming through these walls and messing with them reading through things trying to find the book that you know edward or emily is after um to really mess with with jeremy and stop them from from going further into this dreamscape mm-hmm. i thought that was a really nice touch especially considering it's so bright and airy and beautiful yeah it was a really nice subversion it's kind of the same with the the swamp setting of Dissetto and then it being very Lovecraftian, which is very New England, very kind of, you know, dark, foresty, cold sort of place, whereas getting sweaty with the flies is <laughs> is a bit different. Um, Alone in the Dark is, the, from the 1992 game onwards, is steeped in Lovecraft lore and Lovecraft books, Lovecraft references. Some of the monsters are taken directly from his works, um, as well as actual titles from within the Cthulhu mythos, which is a wider um, collection of stories that authors write under using the rules of kind of Lovecraft's universe. Um, they're all taken from there and referenced in there. And I think Alone in the Dark 2024 does that really well as well and continues that trend of looking back, pulling things and going, oh, I'll have that one. That's mm-hmm. really nice. I mean, right from the very beginning, like there are so many at least to my recollection, so many Lovecraft stories that just start with a letter, someone receiving a letter Mm. about Mm. something weird going on, and then you follow that thread, and through the accumulation of secret knowledge or whatever it is, um, it becomes this descent into madness, and I like how the structure of this game really evokes that. Again, starts with a letter from Mm. Jeremy. 
you read it, you know something's wrong. The more documents you uncover throughout the game, the further you get into the minds of these characters, the more the characters you are you are controlling lose their minds mm. and become less convinced about their own reality and what they're seeing to the point where if you're playing through Canby's story, he starts to wonder whether his memories are even his, whether he's been to this mansion before, whether he's a pa- been a patient there mm-hmm. in that lack of, uh, that deterioration of psychology um, uh, juxtaposed alongside this unknowable cosmic threat, I think is yeah. manages to make what could be a ridiculous scale, an overwhelming scale, personal and impactful still. Yeah, for sure. I think the kind of cult reference that comes very much at the end of the game where you kind of uncover the the different parts of it is, I mean, it's a direct Lovecraft story that I feel that it's a, a, a reference to, but the cult nature of it as well and kind of praying to gods that are so big and indefinable that there's no way of knowing what or, or tr- truly who they are, what their intentions are. The the, the cultish nature of that is very the void, isn't it? Like yeah. very something like that if we were to pull it from kind of modern media as well. Like things like The Colour Out of Space, Dagon, Reanimator, these Lovecraft stories all are very at home with Alone in the Dark. Mm-hmm. And it's a really nice pantheon to be a part of because that's what it feels like, doesn't it? The Lovecraft pantheon. <laughs> Great <laughs> words. Yeah. God, just, yeah. It's a, uh, like you said, you know, that pantheon <laughs> is so rich there's so many things that you can pull from but i think more importantly they've those stories those characters those worlds have been reinterpreted so many different times Mm -hmm. by different authors working within that space and i think alone in the dark 2024 kind of continues that Mm -hmm. legacy in a way by as we mentioned in the previous episode which you should definitely watch or listen to Mm -hmm. um you know they blend the old Lovecrafty influences that were in the original games with a more modern focus on psychology and mental health that was still present in the pantheon of Lovecraft stuff to begin with, (laughs) but it's just kind of really drilling down on that element and saying, oh, this was always there. Let's reinterpret that. Let's expand it. Let's blow it up for this more modern take on the mythos. Mm. Um, How do you think the wider Cthulhu mythos and the Lovecraft pantheon Eh. Uh, connections kind of make horror more potent in general. How do you feel like cosmic horror works to make something scary? You know what I mean? Kind of separate to Alone in the Dark, but referencing to it if you want to as well. It's just weird, isn't it? Like, it's just a weird, it's a weird pantheon. And it's one that (laughs) (laughs) could get used in that now. Absolutely. Um, In a more serious note, though, I think um, just that element that... The world is not what it seems to be mm-hmm. is frightening. Mm-hmm. And I think that's linked very well in this game through the focus on m- mental health because it's like you can't trust the world around you. You can't even trust your mind. And I like that mm-hmm. cosmic horror focuses so much on that corruption of the mind and, you know, manifesting internalized trauma from this forbidden knowledge into physical grotesqueness and beasties and tentacle creatures from the beyond and i think that uh intersection between mind and matter as it were Mm. uh, makes that brand of horror just so important Mm. yeah i think it's also a mix of like science versus the supernatural Mm. for me because i really enjoyed you know all the little sort of astronomical like nods um you know like with the horoscopes and then the the constellations and things like that that people still kind of misjudge as like oh you know if you believe in horoscopes you're just stupid and you know it's it's all made up sort of thing but obviously there are real elements to it there are real scientific things i'm not claiming that all horoscopes are real or anything like that yeah but But, you know the stars exist yeah yeah, and there's a science behind it and things like that and i think it's the same with like the cults and things yeah okay fair enough we all know that it's very unlikely that these big godly creatures and stuff aren't real but there are cults still all over the world at the moment that believe that you know they're going to be saved by this divine creature that have sacrificed people that have you know let people die or suffer in order to achieve this this higher power and i just think the time setting of it being in like the 1920s the 1930s when we didn't have things like social media to educate us on you know these things 
being a load of rubbish it just makes that all the more convincing that you would believe that especially somewhere like New Orleans where you know it's it's kind of renowned for having that sort of witchcraft voodoo vibe like there's a big community there that really believe in things like that even now I like anything where I can almost sort of put myself in that position and understand why they might believe certain things Mm. even if I know in my mind that you know that's it's a bit out of this world (laughs) like you wouldn't really believe it but I think it's it's different than just straight up in like a horror game or a horror film or anything where you see people that just put themselves in a position where you can sit at home and you go well, I would never be in that position. <laughs> I just wouldn't be that stupid. I wouldn't go there. But with things like cults and, you know, mixing the science and the supernatural and stuff, I think you're only a few steps away from sort of, oh, yeah, I could believe that. I could get sucked into that. I could, you know, be promised a higher power if I sort of did these things. You're allowed to take the deal. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm just gullible. <laughs> I don't know if you would agree, but um, to me one of the majorly scary things about cosmic horror and Lovecraft horror is the idea that there's something deeply wrong mm. that you just can't see. Mm. Like, like there's something deeply wrong everywhere, but mm. you don't have the knowledge or you don't have the, the know-how to actually understand it or consider it in that sort of sinking feeling that things on the surface look pristine like they do in the in the manner of alone in the dark it looks Mm -hmm. opulent it looks pristine it looks perfect but it's not and you can uncover that at any moment if you go down the wrong um avenue as someone with an anxiety disorder yeah the uh idea that there's something terrible happening that you can't control and you're not privy to Mm -hmm. i think is just so potent the fact that like you were saying Liz with cults and conspiracies you know like the idea that there are these huge sort of powers that you aren't a part of but are negatively impacting everything that you have to interact with that to me is so scary because it's like whoa this is all happening six feet below the surface and you were this close to you know interacting with it this entire time I find that very traumatizing. Oh, it's like you're always like a meter away from a rat or something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I just spent five or a minutes. Spider. Yeah. Go oh, on that's a... what it is. Like. <laughs> spider. <It's not> right. <laughs> I just spent five minutes going on a tangent, and you summed it up with the perfect one line yeah. and analogy. I should have just said that. That is exactly what I meant. The idea that you're always a few yeah. meters away from a rat is yeah. is exactly what I was trying to get at. <laughs> or a spider. What? Or a spider. Well, I'm not going to make any uh, factual claims here. But yeah, that that's something is in the walls watching you. That. Yeah. It's all a veneer, like, and that you could shatter it at any moment. It's kind of like the Dark Souls, Elden Ring kind of vibe of of seeing something further. Or probably Lords of the Fallen is the best example of that in games that is a little bit of a step out of classic horror. Um, but you can transport between the underworld and the overworlds mm. uh, by shining your light in a certain direction. It's like it's like the black light, isn't it? Where you yeah. see yes. blood splattered on a wall and you go in a hotel room and you hope it's blood. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, like that kind of not the knowledge is the worst part knowing it is the worst part i feel like lovecraft is that and that is that in alone in the dark as well i can't believe we've gone this entire podcast talking about lovecraft and lovecrafty influences and not mention bloodborne because that works in pretty much the exact same way right of giving you a certain style of horror and then revealing it to be cosmic in nature alone in the dark plays with that in a way i think between the dark man and the cult Mm. the fact that you have something initially so kind of cosmic and out there and really defined by psychology and history and magic but then that is juxtaposed immediately by just the cult that was around you the whole time that (laughs) isn't even really bothered about the dark man or whatever he's up to or if he's even real because they have their own god they have their own plans and that was happening around you while you were preoccupied with something else (laughs) entirely oh i think that's just it it is very cosmic in nature isn't it that the 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 pantheon not to say it again <laughs> but like the outer the pantheon of outer gods is like a, a like a lovecraft thing that he's created and and these creatures are references to those as well but the whole idea is that they all have their own powers they all have their own influences and they're all doing their own thing and have their own worshippers and have their own people that kind of deal with them as well so the cult like being very focused on the tree and the black goat and then we've got um jeremy dealing with the dark man to try and 
undercut that or to make his own deals and figure out the Heartwood curse and everything uh, that they own, that they both just go on their own paths to figure it out and then it comes together at the end and makes sense is is very tied into his style of writing his style of stories the Cthulhu mythos at large and it's it's kind of like taking a flip through all the pages and going oh hell that yeah this all this all ties together I get it because it's part of a larger circle of beings oh scary oh. yeah oh. um so I want to talk to you a little bit about the Dark Man now. I think that's a good a good place to kind of focus on him. Um, and how how do you think the Dark Man intensifies the horror of the game in in his presence and his being? I think he's just the perfect sort of looming spectre. Mm. Um, I really really loved the moment in the barracks where he just sort of appears like just slightly around the corner you can't see him but you can you know that Emily can um and I think he just he's this really creepy presence but I think in a kind of comedic way I think like Josh mentioned in the first episode that you know he's sort of based on something that um Jeremy saw as a child he very much gave me like jester mm. vibes like with the mask and the the outfit and stuff we have one here hold on oh there oh, we go. Perfect. Jester vibes. I'm sorry if you're listening on audio, but... It, whoa, hey! <laughs> oh, it's there me, he is! It's the dark man! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, not quite as creepy. I'd say creepier. Creepy. I'd say creepier. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just smash the set. <laughs> it's, it's all going wrong. The dark man's truly here. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, I loved him. I thought he was really cool. Um, I... I feel like I was kind of expecting a reveal of what he looked like underneath the mask, but I don't know if it's it's potentially better that we didn't. Oh, I think so. You know, yeah. um, oh, the the incantation, mm -hmm. the film, and not to do. I feel like it's impossible to spoil because you don't really know what you see. No. But um, it's about the the kind of whole film is about them seeing something that they shouldn't have and yeah. what's under the mask. And then even when you, you like you get the option to see, it's like oh, I can't really comprehend what this is. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, like I think that's kind of the Dark Man's vibe, isn't it? It's yeah. just like whatever you see is going to be so much worse. Uh, mm. Whatever you think is going to be so much worse than what you see. And even if you do see it, will you be able to comprehend it? And that's the thing. I think every time I saw him, I was sort of like oh yeah, he's pretty creepy, but I wonder what he looks like under the mask. And I was sort of imagining him like Jason Voorhees, mm. like, you know, sort of deformed and and gooey and <laughs> just gross. And I think that is, for me, what made him even scarier. Mm. Like you say, it's, it's the unknown. Yeah, that he is so suave and you had that image of him as well, yeah. like that he is this very clean cut pharaoh kind of guy and then you're thinking oh I bet he's real gooey under there <laughs> yeah. like that, that uh, contradiction is, mm -hmm. is really nice I think you two have both summed up the appeal of their character perfectly so I'll try not to just rephrase <laughs> everything you've both said but I think that element of seeing something you weren't supposed to and having that stay with you is really mm -hmm. potent there's that I think it's the Cormac McCarthy the road quote where it's like you remember what you want to forget and you forget what you want to remember. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually applies really well to horror because the idea of Jeremy being a kid and in the context of mythology, literally being like imprinted with the dark man's presence mm -hmm. on his psyche in the curse. I love that um, properly horrific detail that his dad, Jeremy's dad, went home that night and bit off his own tongue, by the way. <laughs> yeah. That's just yeah. outrageous. But that idea of seeing something that you weren't supposed to and mm -hmm. having it stay with you, I think the dark man epitomizes that so well and i like that he has that effect on the playable characters especially mm -hmm. emily in her story where once she's seen him suddenly it's not just a battle against this physical entity but it's a battle for her, her own psyche because he's trying to invade it and that element so <laughs> oh, i'm gonna get you i'm gonna get you um <laughs> he does that really well <laughs> For sure. I, as, as uh, you know, I did the Alone in the Dark Haunted House experience and they have mm -hmm. a, they had a real life person in the Dark Man outfit standing and looming over things and just kind of appearing in places. And oh my God, it was like, <laughs> like having that kind of first hand experience of it and being able to contextualize seeing 
something that doesn't fit in with the environment mm-hmm. at all. That's literally okay, a pharaoh with like bug's wings on his head that's like wearing this this beautiful suit. I'm like, uh, what? Like <laughs> in the middle of like an old decrepit house that's lost all its charm and luster. It's like it's just it's so I I love the I I just love contradictions. I love contrast. Mm-hmm. I love juxtaposition and I feel like Dark Man absolutely embodies all of that really really well and it makes it really he's a great conduit for great game design as well because just having that design like you said that contrast with everything else allows you to get that spectacular moment when you do go to his tomb and you do see that Mm -hmm. sky and you get that cool puzzle within the sarcophagus with with the light and everything so Mm -hmm. his presence in the game allows it to get weird but in a good way it allows the environment to take a nice turn from the more intentionally mundane manner into something that is incredibly juxtaposed with it where you have this wide open desert space yes. this black sun and then you're kind of going down into his tomb oh scary mm. um so the dark man himself i kind of want to talk about him kind of in reference to lovecraft as well because i f- it would be remiss to not mention his inspirations now i might butcher the pronunciation of this but the dark man is an embodiment of Nyarlathotep. 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 Um, so, yeah, there we go. Uh, and this is one of the outer gods that is about madness and kind of messing with people in Lovecraft's own stories. The Dark Man as a name itself is a moniker that was created by Ron Shiflett in 1998. Um, and it's a creature comprised of black smoke and fiery red eyes, which you can kind of see with the way that he moves around with his mm-hmm. with his smoke um, in in the game. Like when you're in Tarawaya and he's moving around, like vaping. It's <laughs> spooky. <laughs> um, and his whole thing is that he makes bargains and unleashes hellish revenge on those that cross him, which is why he's so obsessed with Jeremy, because Jeremy's looking for ways to get out of it with or Emily and... Uh, Edward are doing that for him on his behalf and that's why he kind of gets all mixed up with everyone. But visually um, Nyarlathotep, Nyarlathotep is a pharaoh that's that's his whole deal um, and he cultivates propaganda and followers in human form rather than classic eldritch horror and is fixated on madness rather than destruction. So you can see where these two images of the dark man and Nyarlathotep have been put together to create Alone in the Darks, the Dark Man, um, and make something quite unique, but also very referential to Mr. Lovecraft. Yeah, I think with his implementation in the game, I like that there are a bunch of different Lovecraftian influences directly referred to, but they're also kind of known by the cast Mm. themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, I think there's a great bit later on in the game where you find out that the orderlies have actually been dressing up as the dark man they have a dark man costume (laughs) presumably to terrify jeremy with because they don't think he's real so they might have just been walking around (laughs) peering into his room trying to scare him because they don't um think he's real but they have presumably from jeremy at least heard of that story so Mm -hmm. the way that they kind of play with the idea of um he is a literal figment of Jeremy's madness, maybe even the cause of Jeremy's madness, but he is being used and his image anyway is being used and perverted and twisted by the orderlies who are kind of just um, using their own human methods to extend Jeremy's <laughs> madness. It's like, that guy is pulling a double shift. He's doing well. <laughs> oh, God. It is, it, it is really good. I just I think his whole implementation and, the, and the, the references he draws on, I think is really nice. And that that he is messed with in game as well. It's just, it feels very referential to the way that they've drawn the character together from all these pieces of lore, like you're saying. I think it's really cool. Um, how do you feel about the true villain of the story being the black goat of the woods, being this evil tree? <laughs> I love the breath it I love take that. then. I, I just don't know if that is the true villain. I'm still convinced that Grace is the true villain. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I did like the reveal. I enjoyed that whole like final act. It, it went from sort of quite a chill, you know, wander around, do some puzzles, shoot some creepy things to full on like raging war and yeah. i love that as like a resident evil girly yes it's a lot like that 
boss fight in Resident Evil mm -hmm. uh, 4 where he looks like a big scorpion, Mendez, yes. where he's in the barn and the flames burning. I felt like the, the ending boss fight was very similar to that. Very Resident Evil co dude. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. I thought it was, it was great. I do still... I'm still team Grace. <laughs> I was half expecting her head to like pop out of that giant yeah. creature's body and for her to be like, it was me. <laughs> so. I love how much you've got like a beef you've got with Grace. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Like, I don't want to say that I'm like a kid hater or anything, <laughs> but she just, I don't know. There was just something about her. She was, she was quite rude all the way through, but then she did it with this really like saccharine sort of sweet voice and... Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm just the I hate Grace Club. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd Sorry, be with you. Grace. I'm a big tree lover. Mm -hmm. Um, especially ones that can rip me in half like this one can. Yeah. So when that reveal came and we got that amazing <laughs> This tree and the scene. last unicorn, you two are two favourite trees. <laughs> <laughs> so we got that scene towards the end where it's, you know, we already know that the cult has a different god they're praying to. We kind of don't know what that is. You know, it's the the black goat and it's the something, something of a thousand young. Is that just oh, it? Oh yeah, the mother of a thousand mother young. Mother of a thousand young and your brain's like, well, what can that be? And then the tree comes to life and you get, I mentioned earlier about how I think violence is used in a great way in the mm -hmm. game because it's kind of sparing when it comes to like the proper go. So you've kind of had this build up all game and you've been waiting for some kind of confrontation. You've been waiting for the, the boil to spill mm -hmm. over and then it does in this glorious way where the tree is eating everyone. <gasps> like I said, tearing off limbs, yeah. crushing people, throwing them around like ragdolls <laughs> and you get that immense payoff to the 10 12 hours of build up so in terms of selling me on a concept i don't think you can get much better than a sequence like that and after that i was thinking i mean let me shoot this tree in the face <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna figure out a way yeah you really f see some people get like splatted like a bug from these like mm. big wormy tentacle things and i think just anything that's like slightly worm like is just really <laughs> freaky like you can just imagine it being like slimy and wet and then like just big splat oh, oh yeah i yeah i love that and then when it's like it goes to the cut scene when it's done its destruction at one point like i had to like walk around someone's discarded yeah. legs <laughs> just their legs on the floor ripped from the other half of their body and i was like yeah, it's go time. <laughs> it's go time. Hey, go that's what it is. Oh, great. Well, um, this is, I think, a reference to Shub, which is another one of Lovecraft's monsters, who in the lore, she's an outer god that is constantly spouting off horrible young. So these kind of mother of a thousand young, this black goat of the woods, the terrible mummy is... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's very shub coded. Um, the thing with awakening shub is it would like signal the end of the world and all that sort of thing as well. So the, her not getting her sacrifice and turning into this terrible creature is very like it, it just feels very coded towards that sort of mythology. Um, she is the most extensively worshipped in the entire Cthulhu mythos and is a big tentacly beast associated with the earth, which is why she's got like a tree appearance in the game as well. So I think that kind of all ties into a very Shub related mm -hmm. Lovecraft monster and a very cool reference for Lovecraft fans and also something to read up on afterwards as well because she's, got got she's got a lot of stories. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting one to look at um but she's one of the she's one of the big players like she's like a a great one maybe um my lovecraft knowledge isn't like as strong as some but so forgive me if i use the wrong phrases but yeah she is she's a, she's a big player in the pantheon they haven't uh skimped on getting the a-listers spent a lot of good yeah. money to get mommy into this <laughs> exactly. game exactly huh? yeah. oh big mommy shub it's cool if there's still the uh there's like a still i know i keep going back to it I'm, I'm like a broken record, <laughs> but I like how the writers and the developers keep that psychological element, even though you've got this otherworldly mm. big tree causing havoc. Mm. I like it when you, if you play as can be and the tree starts whispering to you early on before it manifests as this big mm. beast and you get an alternate ending if you kind of give in to its wishes and give it a sacrifice. So the idea that it's sort of in business for itself and is infecting you, the player, before you are even fully aware that the Dark Man isn't necessarily the main villain of the piece, I thought that was really nicely handled and engaging in a bit of foreshadowing, making that payoff even more satisfying. Yeah. 
than it is just from a visual or narrative beat perspective. Yeah, I think it kind of recontextualizes the Dark Man as maybe not a villain either. I feel like the Dark Man is a, a means to an end. He's there mm -hmm. to make he's there to make business, do deals. <laughs> yeah. He's there to be like, Jeremy, you want to stop the the coming of Shub, then let's go. Or I should say the black goat of the woods. You want to stop the coming of the black goat of the woods, then let's go. Let's make a deal. I'll just have your whole mind and <laughs> that'll be fine. So uh, you know, they, they did make a deal at the end of the day. Jeremy did give in to the 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 Dark Man and make this deal to protect and house the terror that would have like eradicated the world in this this house that has been built literally for the tree as well because they reference mm -hmm. that it has to be built the conservatory must have been built around it around it and the house built afterwards as well so the dark man knows all of this and has made this deal and has sorted it out with jeremy big jez <laughs> and it's just I, I just think it's a really interesting way of looking back going oh wow okay we really had the wrong idea about this guy yeah they kind of do that uh godzilla thing of just let them fight yeah you know? <laughs> come on we've got these two beings we can't really control either of them what if they just cancel each other out I, going back to sort of the foreshadowing thing and you know planting those seeds mm. earlier on what? hey hey um i like that the tree at least for me i don't know how you both thought when you were playing through the game but as soon as you see that tree i thought that's a strange tree i isn't thought, it? I thought you know? that's a really nice tree me i would too. i would put a conservatory around that tree <laughs> and instantly ran around the back i was like what's hiding what, yeah. what treasures are there like is there a lagny appy yeah like <laughs> <laughs> and there's even ah oh, man i i I'm obsessed with this deal, but there's like a broken window mm -hmm. in the conservatory behind the tree. Mm -hmm. And that's where Grace escapes from at the very end. So I just like that going through it a second time, maybe with the other character mm -hmm. or even just kind of replaying it generally. Like you can see those little moments that are building up to something much bigger. And I always love a game where it gives you something in the environment or it gives you a note that you don't quite know the significance of. Yeah. Almost until it's too late. Like you know, might notice the tree earlier on and think that is peculiar. Yeah. But you don't really uh, think about it again until it's trying to bite your face off. And <laughs> yeah. that is horror to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's true because you do it in horror films as well, don't you? When you've watched a million of them, you're always sort of looking in the background for the clue. And then when, some, you know, it's like Chekhov's knife or whatever. and it Shotgun. Always <laughs> shotgun, yeah. yeah. And it always comes back round at the, the end and you're like, oh, yeah, that was why I, you know, that's why I took that in. And then you'll sit and watch something with like a non-horror fan and they'll be like gobsmacked and you'll yeah. be like, nah, I knew it was nah. coming. Why are they showing us this? Was coming. Yeah. Well, I couldn't believe it. One of the first... Um, documents that you get in the game is from jeremy literally saying everyone in this place is a cult member yeah and they're trying to kill me and they're they're not friends with me and I, I i've completely forgot about that at the start but like the entire plot the entire plot twist more or less is right there in the first document yeah. just be, but because you don't believe jeremy is a reliable narrator mm -hmm. you think well we'll give it a bit we'll investigate see what's happening and then you get so obsessed with the dark man it's like uh oh yeah, maybe he was out of something <laughs> yeah because i wonder like you say because jeremy had already made this deal with with the dark man what would have happened if emily just didn't go well I, like, that's it would they have still they'd the have all died of, yeah yeah I got a bone to pick with Jeremy about that, actually. He keeps saying over and over again, he's like, oh, Emily, I didn't want you to come. I've read that letter. Yeah. <laughs> the implications were very strong. Like, you can't give someone a little tease of, oh, I uh, might be trapped in a Lovecraftian nightmare and expect them not to come. Yeah. I would go to see what's going on. I mean, on she there. does get her own back, though, doesn't she, in quite a horrific she way? She does, actually. Yeah. 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 That was the most disturbing part of the whole thing for me, I think. What, big lobotomy? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I realised that, obviously, like, he he'd gone a bit loopy but i thought that was just like the trauma of everything and then when the guy was like oh yeah you've lobotomized him i was like wow okay like i think he probably would have been better off if you didn't go oh i was just like that's a really neat incision like that we've yeah. done there like oh i've just tripped Accidental. and lobotomized someone yeah. that's real nice that is <laughs> i like how that's worked out but that was what they were going to do to him anyway wasn't it mm. like i think in the notes dr gray's like if yeah. i just stick an ice pick in his brain i think it will be all right yeah and then uh, emily's left to kind of deal with the idea that she's going to get the heartwood curse as well but the the strange mind madness that's going on mm. um are there any niche references that catch your eye as like a lovecraftian moments or other bits because i know you say seeing the tree first like as in knowing that something's coming with that was there anything else that stood out to you hmm the I'm answer can be no consider. it was for me it was the painting i can't remember the exact story 
But uh, I know there's a sort of, um, there is one that has a Dorian Gray-esque um, angle to it where the painting that you see of someone is <laughs> not what it appears and you kind of, it decays, it looks monstrous and the more monstrous it gets, things go out of whack. So I like that the first time you see that painting of Jeremy, which is really strange, that's kind of what triggers everything. Mm. Like it's immediately after one of the characters stares into that painting that you get the first monster attack. Mm. So that was the one that kind of stood out to me, but I didn't know if I was reading too much into it, if it was more general, but it felt like it was a reference to that story. Yeah, that, just Jeremy's whole painting of himself being, whoa, I'm so scared. <laughs> and then everybody's like, I'm going to keep this one. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did really like that. Um, have, uh, did anything stand out to you? Um, I wouldn't say specifically to a loved Lovecraft story, but I found it interesting that there was um, a film a few years back called Incident in a Ghost Land, mm. um, a horror film, and it's sort of it's about a a girl and her family that are attacked, and then it sort of skips forward to her as an adult sort of telling this story, and it it sort of messes a lot with timelines and things like that, and it kind of gives that cosmic sort of vibe because there's quite a lot of horrible things going on, and it's also very like they're almost sort of human dolls. There's like a lot of creepy dolls around, which made me think of like Gracie's room. And then I remembered that in that film, she's actually an author and she's obsessed with Lovecraft. Mm. And it's sort of, sorry, spoiler alert, but it sort of turns out that she's sort of fictionalised her survival story, sort of based on like Lovecraft horror stories. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know why it just made me think of that film. I think like the dolls and things. And I just thought, oh, you know, had that second thought. Oh, actually, she was obsessed with Lovecraft as well. So I wonder if it was in any way influenced by by the game yeah. or just by Lovecraft in general. I do love that because I think that ties really nicely with Alone in the Dark and kind mm -hmm. of creating your own story that, you, that you're living in and figuring out. Mm -hmm. Like Jeremy moves through his own mind palaces mm -hmm. with the oil rig and Tarawaya and all of these other different places that crop up as levels for you to get through but they're all actually just Jeremy's memories that he's conjured as safe spaces to travel through with his talisman mm -hmm. so it is it is very much the the same sort of thing um I also want to point out a couple of ones that I noted down but Prisoner of Ice is a set one of the collectible sets you can grab that's based on the Infogrames game um, based in the Cthulhu Mythos. So there's a, ah. there's a game called Prisoner of Ice, uh, which was, I think it's either the follow-up or connected to another one. Um, maybe it's Shadow of the Comet. I can't remember precisely, but Prisoner of Ice is one of those. I just thought it was cool that they've got their own Lovecraft games that they're putting into the game as like other references. But um, they were the original uh, developers of Alone in the Dark and then THQ have got, got it and played homage to it which is really nice and very in the alone in the dark spirit and um jacob van astart is a character from a book in the original game this is so niche like <laughs> he's literally a character from a book in the original game which is terra incognita um great name that yeah mm -hmm. Which is which is one of the ones you can pick up in the original love, love in the original Alone in the Dark game. And also he's voiced by Yuri Lowenthal. What? Yeah Spider-Man himself is in this game. Spider-Man? What? <laughs> yeah, Spider-Man. Uh, Jacob Van Astart is, Spi uh, is Spider-Man. Well, I just thought that was really interesting. I don't know. It really popped me. I was like, who? I'm Why? I have to uh, play through this for a third time yeah. just to <laughs> just <laughs> appreciate to that this time around. I was so concerned with sticking that needle in that guy's eye yeah. that I wasn't paying attention to his voice and now I'm kicking myself. Yeah, yeah. well, he's like the the big like tentacle face. He looks like um, Captain Davy Jones. <laughs> he does, <laughs> he? Yeah, yeah. Tentacle energy from uh, uh, parts of the Caribbean. But yeah, uh, those are the two that I kind of clocked. There's so many more though. Mm -hmm. All of the collectible sets all have different meanings. They have forbidden knowledge that you gain through getting them all together as well like when you can get literally the Chekhov shotgun yeah. that's on the wall because it opens up because you read uh, the the set that that's created just interesting mm -hmm. I've also written fun fact down Come so on. I've got that one for Edward Another Carnby so uh, the the name was originally taken from John Carm Carnby and he is the main character of the book The Return of the Sorcerer by Clark Ashton Smith um, which consists of a scholarly recluse uh, who is hired to translate passages from the Necronomicon, which is ah. a Lovecraft 
uh, conception, which has then been pulled through time in Evil Dead and many other horror films throughout throughout history. But yeah, the actual name Can't Be itself is a Lovecraft reference, but buried deep in the mythos. It's just love that. It just keeps going. <laughs> it just keeps it's going. Dripping with the Lovecraftian pantheon. <laughs> yeah, yes. the pantheon. You can't stop the pantheon. <laughs> Play too much Hollow Knight is what it is. That word's just like ingrained in my brain. Um, but yeah, I just think Lovecraft and Alone in the Dark are just, they're, they're lovers. They kiss. <laughs> they are inseparable when it comes to creating horror tension, cosmic energy that is big, vast and noble, that has these alien gods from other dimensions inflicting all sorts of terror on humanity. It's just, it's just really cool. Yeah. Like you said, they kiss. It's the goopiest, slimiest, worst kiss in the world. Yeah. But we love it for it because it deli- delivers um, in an area that I think is well-trodden enough in games. But, I mean, I always am excited when a new Lovecraft game mm. comes around, whether it's a direct adaptation or whether it's just inspired by it. So to kind of, like we were saying in the previous episode, get the grandfather of that back, yeah. sloppy kissing with <laughs> the tentacle oh, monsters yeah. again. Dark man and the tree. Yeah. <laughs> Just oh. imagine like a big worm tongue. Yeah. <laughs> Grima. Uh, I do want to, before we finish off this section, also, Josh, you mentioned to me before the podcast about the Sinking City and yes. uh, the drawing that in. And that's obviously another really Lovecrafty Call of Cthulhu style, like Mouth of Innsmouth. Mouth of Innsmouth? Mouth, at the Mouth of Madness. You know. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Innsmouth is just the. It's the the town, isn't yeah. It? The yeah. I, it, I've forgotten the shadow, shadow, shadow over in his mouth. There we go. But yeah, Sinking City, I thought was a great shout for for a game to pull a reference to. Absolutely, it was a game I was thinking about quite a lot when I was playing through Alone in the Dark. You know, just this idea: if you're playing as Canby, you're this detective in a period setting, and you're kind of like you were saying, Liz. You know, you're using science or you're using the law to try to engage with something that is astronomically not necessarily connected to the laws of physics Mm -hmm. and to see that in Alone in the Dark through Canby who like you say is kind of bumbling his way around in his playthrough just covered in blood and soot and dirt Mm -hmm. going from one creature to the next and tumbling through the manor I thought that ah, I was like yes Yes, more of that, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great game. It's just I, I, when you said it, I was like, oh, yes, that's such a good shout because the whole vibe of Cthulhu being under the water or, you know, some great and noble being being under the water that kind of threatens at the edges of your psyche. It's very, very the call to the black goat, mm-hmm. the dark man, knowing that these other creatures are out there trying to protect humanity from it in Deceto. Just very cool. I think it's the sense of isolation, isn't it? Like what mm-hmm. I love about the setting of Alone in the Dark is that even though this time around the the hospital is, um, it has a population, there are people there, you are not alone. It still feels like you are separated from the rest of the world and reality and you know they accomplish that through the setting here you've got the swamp but in the sinking city you've got the fact that the city is sinking yeah. there is water <laughs> everywhere you are literally trapped and that sense of isolation the sense that you're trapped in a reality that isn't yours and isn't everyone's out to get you mm. i think that is a core of the sort of lovecraft um storytelling devices being an outsider coming into a community that is out to get you and is up to no good yeah yeah that's i mean that's how cults work isn't it that they isolate people from their family and their friends and i think like you say even though there is more than one person at the manor they are still isolated from the rest of the world so it's very easy especially like for people like grace who's like a child surrounded by adults she's isolated in that sense so she's going to believe anything they say she's going to believe the things about the cults and stuff she's going to go willingly into sacrificing herself because she she is a child if she is a child which yeah (laughs) but she's she's gonna go willingly into like doing something if they've promised her the world and told her you know you do this few seconds well few minutes of pain and you'll get all your dreams come true or whatever they're promised um i think yeah isolation is is a massive thing i don't want to i don't want to uh infringe on your next episode ash because i know we're doing southern horror Mm -hmm. um next but that idea of 
in Alone in the Dark, in The Sinking City, and in a bunch of other Lovecraftian um, stories, whether it is a fishing village that is right next to the sea. The idea that you are in a sort of a man-made place, you are mm. in a house that is being retaken or recovered by nature and the natural forces, I think that seeps into this as well, in the feeling of being in uh new orleans and being in the swamp and the bo- ev- the bog <laughs> the bog um <laughs> that kind of crossover and that kind of contamination almost i think just creates a lovecraftian atmosphere mm, definitely and so that we keep it fresh for our southern gothic episode i will cut us off there because <laughs> i've got a trivia quiz coming up yeah let's go oh. Okay, so you guys schlepping your hands together, <laughs> ready to go. I'm going to start you off with one that y- y- you're going to know. You're going to know. Okay. You'd know it deep in your heart of hearts, in your British little hearts. Lovecraft shares initials with what type of British source? Liz. Yeah. HP Brown Source. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I was trying to think for a split second then. I was like, what is it called? <laughs> Is it a trick well, question? I was like, what? It can't just be HP sauce. <laughs> the answer was brown sauce. Oh, okay, but sorry. HP brown sauce. But I know. also, because I, it, it's a nice introduction <laughs> to saying what HP stands for, which is Howard Phillips, because nobody knows HP's name. They just know him as HP Lovecraft. I wouldn't want to be known That's as anything true. other than Lovecraft, really. <laughs> I know, I know. It's a cool name. What if it's the same guy? What do you mean? Yeah. HP Lovecraft, what if he invented... Oh. Brown sauce. I did look this up because this was a question, but uh, it stands for Houses of Parliament. Oh, Houses of Parliament what? sauce. Yeah. Brown sauce is quite Tory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just a strange goop, is what yeah. I was thinking, you know? It's just a strange goop, so it would make sense, I reckon, yeah. if it came from his mind. Because get it off me bacon. You know, I don't want it on there. Oh, yeah. you're not a brown sauce fan? No, nah, red sauce Ooh, all the yeah, way. Yeah, I'm a ketchup girl too. True. Oh, yeah. Is it on mayonnaise? Not on baker sandwich, <laughs> but uh, just always mayo. <laughs> if I can get it mayo on it, I will. <laughs> Maybe on a sausage sandwich. <laughs> mayonnaise and cheese. <laughs> right, so question number two. It's a point of lit. Liz is coming for you now. The So question number two. Nyarlathotep is associated with a specific normal instrument i put that in brackets just so you guys know it's not some otherworldly thing it's just an instrument that he's either accompanied by or touted as playing can you tell me what it is from these three clues (laughs) okay so you'd find it in the woodwind section of an orchestra you can shout in whenever you think you know it's the only woodwind instrument that doesn't require a reed (laughs) A reed. Lizzo also plays this instrument, but I'm unsure if she's a Liz. follower of North Lada. Is it a flute? Yes. I had to check my answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is. I definitely just got it from the Lizzo clue. Yeah. <laughs> that was my uh, Hail Mary. But um, I found a, a little reference here that I've quoted that says he might be accompanied by amorphous flute players, uh, such as in The Rats in the Walls and The Dweller in Darkness, and is himself identified as the Azothian flute player um, from The Parchments of Nom. I dig his dedication to drama. I yeah. dig it his dedication to theatre. I like that he's got his little band of orchestra maniacs following him around, hyping him up. He's got the hype (laughs) flute players. And he's like, no, these are part of my entourage Mm. and you're going to have to deal with them. That just made me think of like the Pied Piper. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Like he's sort of fluting around, Mm. sort of getting his followers to... To come along and yeah. stuff. Well, the maybe madness. making deals with people's parents to give them their children back <gasps> and things. Hi, maybe he's the so- Piper. Yeah. What? Oh my god. Side hustle. He's real. He's real. He's <laughs> existed. Um, I also wrote a note that just says "kind of wild" when he doesn't have a mouth, which I like. <laughs> also, though, like he doesn't. He's <sighs> just smoke under there. He doesn't. Uh, he's he, a mask. He doesn't. He, he's a master of reality. So does he, he doesn't need any vocal cords. He can do what he wants. Yeah. Well, yeah. there you go. That's just something that is associated with one of the inspirations for the Dark Man, who's a big 
Floutist. <laughs> Floutist. <laughs> <laughs> Loves it. So for question number three, Josh, I'm afraid there's no way of coming back here. Getting wrecked. I went too, uh, too strong I did in the I introduction. Fight to the death. Did well, yeah. <laughs> I uh, I went back to kind of the inspirations for the monsters of the game because oh, this is just what I love doing. I just love doing it. So we've had a look at um, the Dark Man being Neil Arthur Tep, and we've had a look at Shub being the Black Goat of the Woods, and now I'm looking at the Mound Beast because that was another one of my favourite beasties from this game. I think it's a very cool design, and I thought, where's that come from? So the question here is, the Mound Beast of the game feels like a nod to the novella The Mound by Lovecraft. Obviously, there's a reference there in the title, isn't there? Which details a horrific underground society accompanied by monstrous crossbred Gyarjothan. But what is their purpose in these subterranean halls? Now, the answers are target practice and fighting pits, pets and bed warmers, or mounts and farming. So that's the idea of the mound beast. So they've done a really cool interpretation of what the mound beast or potentially a Gyarjothan could be um, in Alone in the Dark. So do you, what do you think that would be used for in a subterranean village? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Josh, I'm going to go the mounts. Getting on the back of one of those things would be crazy. It's true. Is it? Yeah. <gasps> they breed the Gyarjothan by combining species with other species as well. So the, the the main interpretation of them here is they have a big horn in their head and they're kind of crossed with other creatures that they've found. Um, they're a bit, some some interpretations is very gorilla-like. But I like our mound beast from Alone in the Dark. When you actually get a good look at its face at the end of Emily's chapter, it's got like a bat nose and a very mm. bat-like like face and then still has like this these big muscles which is it is a quadruped in in the story as well um so it felt like that was a very cool reference to maybe the beasts of the swamp being combined to make this type of mound beast i just thought it was cool and worth mentioning yeah it was cool. sick actually getting the chance to face off with that thing in yeah. emily's story because i played it to as calm be first and i was always thinking where did that freak go you know <laughs> i don't trust that it's not reappeared so then to get, go through that second campaign and think oh, okay it was waiting for me here the whole time yeah. was horrifying but satisfying yeah, definitely. I just think it's a very cool creature. I love a monster design, like all of the um, the wormy men and the tentacle men mm. and then kind of the bog beasts and the inspiration from ghouls from the original game and how those would look now where they've been pulled together by maggots and have multiple heads and different skulls in there and then there's all sorts of creatures that are looking weird. <laughs> yeah, the mind beast is definitely a favourite. But yeah, there we go. Liz, you've won that one. Josh has won the previous one. It's all to play for in episode three. So that is the end of our lovely little look at Lovecraft and Cosmic Horror in Alone in the Dark 2024. So before you come back for episode three, where we look at Southern Gothic horror, where can we find you guys on the internet? Where? Do you want to go first, being as you lost? Oh, thank you. The, com <laughs> the commiseration of it, the <laughs> indignity of it. Yeah, you can find me on most social medias at uh, Josh Brown, but with an extra O. So it sounds like Josh Brown. Josh Brown sauce. <laughs> yeah, and you can find me at kill underscore list L-I-Z-T on Instagram and Twitter. Nice. And you can find me at Ash Millman. There we go. Mm. Right. Lovely stuff. I'm excited to talk about all the horrors of the boggy swamp in our next episode. So we'll catch you there. Bye. See ya. Bye.